In this video, I want to continue where we left off last time, where we were discussing the design of a sequence detector, in particular a Mealy circuit for the detection of a sequence. So if you remember what we talked about last time, we were talking about how a sequence detector take in, takes in a sequence of bits, one bit at a time, clocked through, and then it looks for a particular pattern and will output a 1 as the output Z when that pattern is found and will output a 0 when that pattern is not found. And so this is pretty typical in a lot of digital things, such as looking for patterns in PIN numbers, passwords, um, combination locks, or if you're looking to send a sequence of values such as credit card numbers over the internet. And so the sequence that we were looking for in particular was 101, and we were looking for 101 at any point in the sequence, so we saw this example stream of bits that would come in on X and the corresponding output value on Z. And so 101 is detected for the first time right here, so we get an output of 1. And we also talked about how the sequence detector does not reset when it gets a 101. So in this case, we have 101, and this one, which was the last one in this 101, is actually the first one in the next 101. So both of those count as 101 sequences. And so we started to build a state transition diagram last time. That's where we left off, was we had completed building our state transition diagram. And so we started out with our initial state, which was that we hadn't yet detected that first one in the sequence. And so long as we just kept getting in zeros, we would stay there. And we would advance to the next state, a new state, when we had found the first one that was potentially the beginning of the sequence. And the output there would be zero in both cases, because until we get the full 101 pattern that we're looking for, we have not yet detected the sequence. So this is where we started out. So S0 is our initial state. So long as we keep getting zeros in there, we keep cycling back around to ourself. Our output is zero. And getting zeros brings us back to ourselves. When we get a 1 as the input, that transitions us to S1, but we still have an output of 0. And then we said, well, what should we do if we're in S1 and we get a 1? Well, in that case, we would keep going back around to ourself, state S1, because that could still be the beginning of a 101 sequence. It's not making any progress by having a 0, meaning our last two bits would be 1 and 0, but it could be the beginning of a 101 sequence, that new 1. So we would stay in S1. If we were in S1 and we got a 0, we would transition to a new state, which would indicate that the last two bits were 1 and 0, and we were two bits of the way toward our sequence, which is not represented by either of the states we see on the screen here. And so the third state that we add is representing the fact that 1 and 0 has been detected as the last two bits coming in. And so we are one bit away, potentially, at that point from getting a 101 sequence. So we got to this point, and we said, okay, if you get 1 and 0, then if we get a 1 coming in, we would transition back to S1, because again, this 1 could be the beginning of the next 101 sequence, and that is where we output a 1. So to summarize, we had S0 as our initial state, meaning we either haven't received our first one, or the last thing that we've received is a 0 not preceded by a 1. And so no 1 is detected yet as the beginning of the sequence. S1 means that the last bit that we got in was a 1, and so it could be the beginning of a 101. And it's unknown what the next two inputs would be. It's one and something else will come the next two bits. If it's zero and one, then we'll output a one. Then S2 means the last two inputs that we got were one and zero. And you can see that if you get one and then zero, that is going to indicate that you are two bits into the 101 sequence. And maybe if we get another one, we will have completed the sequence. And if we're in S2 and a 1 is input, that means we did find our sequence. That is this arc right here, and we will output a 1 at that time. And that could be the beginning of a new sequence, and that's why we're going back to S1 right there. And if we're in S2 and a 0 was detected, we said, well, where should we go? 
Well, that would indicate that the last three bits that we received were one, zero, zero. And that unfortunately gets us back to the point where we've made no progress toward 101. And so at that point, we would transition back to S0. And so our complete state transition diagram is what we see here on the screen. If we are in S0 and we keep getting zeros, we will transition back there, outputting a zero. If we get our one there, then we transition over to S1, which indicates the potential beginning of a 101 sequence. If we keep getting ones while we're there, we're going to keep circling around to S1, saying, well, that could be the first one in a 101. That could be the first one in a 101. But then if we're here and we finally get a zero, then we could say, well, that could be one zero. That maybe is the first two bits. And if we get a one as the next bit coming in, yes, we found our sequence. If we get a zero, we've got to start this all over. And we can tell that this is a complete state transition diagram because we have two transition arcs for every one of our states. And all of the transitions go to states that are on the table. So we don't need any new states. We don't need any new transitions. And we have a transition for every input. And we have identified the output for each of those cases. So this is where we left off last time. And now what I want to do is continue from here to derive the circuit that we would need to implement this using D flip-flops. So let's keep going. Now that we have this state transition diagram, we can convert this into a state table. And so in the state table, we're going to list our three states over here. And then we are going to identify where we go and what our output is for every state transition. So the first one, if we are in S0 and we get in a 0, we transition back around to S0. And our output at that case is 0. If we are in S0 and we get in a 1, we transition over here to S1, and our output is also a 0. If we're in S1 and we get in a 0, we transition over to S2, still outputting 0. And if we're in S1 and we get in a 1, we transition back to ourselves, back to S1, and we still output 0. And finally, if we're in S2 and we get in a 0, we see that we transition back to S0, outputting 0. And if we get in a 1, that is the one place where we output a 1, saying that we did find our goal state, and at that point we transition to S1. Now what we're going to do is take this state table and create a binary state table by just assigning binary values to every one of our states. And so we can figure out what we need to do for that by looking at, well, how many states do we have? And that's going to determine how many flip-flops we're going to need. So in this case, we only had three states. And so with two bits, we can represent all three of those state values. So we can um, represent up to four states with two flip-flops. If we only had two states, we can represent that with a single flip-flop. If we have more than four, let's say we had six states, we would need three flip-flops, and with three flip-flops, you can represent up to eight. So every time you add another flip-flop, that doubles the number of states that you can represent. But in this case, we only need two flip-flops because we only have three states, and so that is between two and four. And so we're going to have two flip-flops, which means we need a two-bit binary representation for each one of our states. Okay, and so we're just going to make this arbitrary assignment. 0, 0 is going to be S0, 0, 1 is going to be S1, and 1, 0 is going to be S2. There's nothing special about that. Uh, later on in the course, we'll talk about how to potentially choose the binary representation. But at this point, we're just arbitrarily assigning binary values to the different states. And so now it becomes a matter of taking this state transition table that we had here, the state table, and just doing a find replace. Everywhere we see S0, we're going to put 0, 0. Everywhere we see S1, we're going to put 0, 1. Everywhere we see S2, we're going to put 1, 0. The outputs are not changing at all. So this is simply a copy and paste from up here to down here. And so this is indicating our next states in binary based upon this. Um, and so A plus and B plus are representing the binary values for what the next state should be represented as in binary after a clock based upon our current input x and our current state ab.
And so now from here, what we are going to do is we are going to take this and put these values into a set of Carnot maps, which will allow us to derive the logic for each of these. And so we're going to use D flip-flops for this particular implementation. Later on, we're going to see how to do this with other flip-flop implementations. But for right now, let's just do D because all you need for the D logic is what you put in is what you're going to get out. So what you want that next state to be better be what you put into the D input. And so that will allow us to figure out very easily what we need to put into our K maps. Let's go ahead and escape out of PowerPoint and I'm going to show you how to fill these values in onto a K map. So we have this over here on the document cam and I'm going to take my table and put that right here. So here are my binary values from the binary table. And what you'll notice is I've got A, B here and X across the top. So I have organized my Carnot map in a very similar fashion to how I've organized my table. Now the first thing you might notice is that on my table I have 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. I don't have a 1, 1. Well, that is because 1, 1 is not assigned to a state. So what that means is that becomes a don't care. And so if you have a state representation on your K map that is not an actual reachable state, not a valid value for a state, all of the entries for that particular state become don't cares. And so right here, right here, and right here, all of the entries for where A, B are 1, 1 become don't cares. And then it's simply a matter of saying, okay, A is going to be on the left, so these are A values, B is going to be on the right, and then my Z values are over here. So I'm going to fill this in as the left values into my DA table, which is equal to A plus. I'm going to fill in my right values here into my DB, which is equal to B plus. And then I'm going to take the output Z and put it into my Z table. So let's just go ahead and copy these on down. So I've got 0, 1, 0. So I'm going to put that in here. 0, 1, 0. I'm going to take these three zeros, put them in on the right. And then I'm going to fill in my B values. All zeros and all ones, nice and easy. And then finally, I'm going to fill in my Z values, all zeros on the left. And then 0, 0, 1 on the right. And so now it's a simple matter of just circling the groups. And so here I just have this single one. And so I can circle that with the don't care below it. And so I'm going to make this group of two. So my DA logic, which is going to be equal to A plus, is going to be X prime B. And then over here, I can circle this entire column. So my DB logic, which is equal to B plus, is simply going to be X. And then over here, my Z logic, I've just got this 1, 1 down here at the bottom. So I'm just going to circle this bottom group of 2 on the bottom right. And so my Z logic is going to be X, A. And so you can see this. I wanted to do that on paper so you could see how it was derived rather than just skipping on through to the slides to see the solution. But if you do skip on ahead to the solution, you will see that there is a nice, neatly organized, nicely circled, a lot better written than I can by hand, um, solution to this. But I wanted you to see exactly how that solution is derived. It's basically just taking the binary state table, translating it over into the K maps, and then figuring out how to circle it. And that works out very nicely um, for this particular logic. And so if we were to go ahead and implement this in a circuit, we would need two D flip-flops. We would need the outputs of those D flip-flops, the states, to be taking an X, anding it with A to get the output Z. And then we would need to drive those D flip-flops with this logic here. So let's see what that would look like. Here are two D flip-flops. The output A is designated over here. B is designated over there. Notice they have a common clock. 
And whether it's rising edge or falling edge doesn't really matter so long as that's happening together and both of them are the same. And so let's first look for our X prime B for our DA logic. So here is where DA comes in and there is X prime and B. Then over here, our DB logic is just X. So here X is coming in and it's connected right there. And then finally, our Z logic is just X and A. And so here we have A and X. And so that is our output Z. So this is how you would go from beginning to end trying to derive logic using a D flip-flop. We can look at this with other flip-flops, um, but we will see that next time. So for right now, we are going to stop. This is our Mealy implementation. And in the next video that I'm going to record, we will develop the same logic using a more circuit, and we will look at how to implement that logic using the other types of flip-flops that we have talked about in class. So please continue to the next video.